tonight's sharing based on a chapter in the book Walking in the Buddhist Footprint. And tonight's sharing is on simplicity. Now, a few years ago, I was invited by the Rotary Club, local Rotary Club here, to give a talk. And I accepted. And there were hardly any Buddhists in the about 50 or so audience. And so I gave them a talk without any reference at all to any religion. And it turned out pretty well. But the questions that they raised were very relevant questions. And these questions include questions like, why are there so many problems despite all the religions that our dear world has offered? Why are different religions offering different things? Why are there so many conflicts within and without even that particular religion? So I was tasked to address them. And I now modify that talk to suit our audience, which is basically an audience of Buddhists. And I think one of the fundamental things when we look at and see why are there so many issues in the world, why are there so many issues within Malaysia, outside Malaysia, in the region, in America, in the greater context of Europe and Africa. It's simple things like these. Many of you will know that this was what Thomas Jefferson wrote when he drafted the American Declaration of Independence. When Thomas Jefferson drafted the American Declaration of Independence, one of the most famous lines is this line. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, when Jefferson wrote these lines, he was writing this with reference to what is the perceived very unequal treatment the English had for the English versus the Americans, the colonies, the unequal taxation. And he felt that the English were not treating the colonies equally. And so he wasn't talking with reference to different races. He was really talking with reference to his own race. And that he see it as self-evident that the English men and the colonies are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, from the Buddhist viewpoint, there are many errors in Jefferson's statement. First, we are not created by any external being. We create ourselves through our own deeds, our own causes, our own karma. And second, none of us are equal. And that this is so is manifestly obvious. If we are just to look around, look around us in Malaysia, look around us in Southeast Asia, and of course the greater world. And you will see that human beings are not equal. Some have long lives, some have short lives, some are very pretty, some are not so pretty, some are very brilliant, some are a bit slow, some are healthy, some are sickly. And this was one of the things the Buddha pointed out very clearly to us, that we are in fact different. And we are different for many reasons, one of which is of course our karma. And of course, there are other reasons, including biological, genetic, environment, and that we are not created by some external being. We are created by ourselves. But we all will pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is something all of us want. Now, if you look at this picture, you will just see a bamboo forest. I used to have a cluster of bamboo in my old house, my old, old house. And this is actually part of a very profound Tan lesson. A man with many problems sought the advice of a Tan master. And he said, oh, why do people have no problems? Why do I have so many problems? Why are my days, my children, blah, blah, blah. So many issues, no end. And the master said, wait, 
at the end of the day, when no one is around, I will tell you the secret. So he waited and he waited. At the end of the day, the master said, let us go for a walk. And then they just walked to the back of the monastery into the forest. And the master was just looking at the forest. And this man was eager for that secret answer. And he asked the master again, what's the answer? Why? Why do I have so many issues? Why do people not have, etc.?" And the master simply said, look at this beautiful forest. Look at all these bamboo trees. Look at all the other trees. You see some trees are tall. Some trees are short. Some leaves are yellow and withered. Some leaves are green and healthy. Some plants are dead. Some trees are barren. But that is the secret to life. We are all different. We cannot expect that every one of us is going to be living perfect lives with no worries, no pain, perfect health. Because none of us have the same causes and conditions. That, the Buddha said, is reality. And the Buddha taught us that we must have right view. We must see reality and not what we want to see. Yesterday, my wife attended a Dharma class, a Dharma discussion. At the end of which she came and talked to me about the part of that discussion. She was not quite satisfied with the answers that was raised in that discussion. And this includes, what do we mean by taking refuge? She was not quite satisfied with the answer that came out from her group. So I said, to put it very simplistically, if it rains, I stand underneath an umbrella. That, I said, is taking refuge. But that proved to be a little bit too simple. And so we discussed further. I said, yes, you're right. We take refuge in the Buddha. We take refuge in the Dhamma. And we take refuge in the Sangha. But the reality is, we actually take refuge in the Dhamma in the realities of life, in how nature works. And we try our best to go along with it and not go against it, insisting on what we want instead of what it is. That means wrong view. Things are going to be impermanent. Some trees are going to be tall. Some trees are going to be short. Some leaves are going to fall down early. Some leaves are going to stay up in the tree for a longer time. Whether you like it or not, a flower will wither and weeds will grow. That is nature. That is Dhamma. Nature is Dhamma. And so basically, the Buddha wanted us to see what is reality, what is real, and not what we imagine or what we demand it to be. Now the Buddha, we take refuge in the Buddha. But the Buddha became the Buddha. Buddha because of his understanding of the Dhamma. Ultimately, it is the Dhamma that we take for future. And then my wife asked, and what about the Sangha? I said, for 2,600 years, the Sangha were the people who transmitted the Dhamma all the way down from the Buddha to present day. They are the carrier. They are the protectors. They are the ones who kept that teaching alive for all of us. And hence, that is why we say, we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. We take refuge in the three jewels. But these three jewels share a common denominator. And that is the Dhamma. It is that precious, that simple Dhamma that we need to help us deal with life. And it's actually quite simple. It's man that make it quite complicated. We invented all kinds of rites and all kinds of religions and all kinds of rituals. But the Dhamma that the Buddha taught is direct, it's timeless, and honestly, very, very direct to the point. But let's listen to a much younger Keanu Reeves. Let's see what his take on these same refuges are. Thank you. 
When we are uncomfortable or anything unpleasant happens, we look to take refuge in something. Usually we turn to food, alcohol, sex, drugs, money, power, or relationships. But none of these things gives us the lasting protection or satisfaction we're looking for. When you understand you can't find lasting happiness in samsara, then the desire to find true refuge becomes strong. In Buddhism, we take refuge in the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. The Buddha is like the doctor who understands your disease and knows how to treat it. The Dharma, his teachings, is the medicine he prescribes, and the Sangha is the spiritual community that helps you to take the medicine. To take refuge is to finally seek protection from suffering in a way that can really help you. When we think about the ultimate nature of reality and what causes us to suffer, this is the true meaning of refuge. So dear Sumin, it's really standing underneath an umbrella and that umbrella is the Dhamma. The Buddha taught us the Dhamma. He became the Buddha because of the Dhamma. That Dhamma is the GPS of your life, my life, our lives. Every time we have issues, we have problems, a GPS helps us to find the way. Similarly, the Dhamma is the GPS of my life. If I'm unhappy, I look and I say, what does the Dhamma tell me to do? It tells me to let go, for example. And I say, yes, I will let go. So it teaches us a harmonious way of living. Are you aware, Sumin, that the Noble Eightfold Path is actually eight ways of making sure that you live harmoniously within yourself, within your society, within your occupation, within your family, and of course, at the same time, improving yourself every day. It is your umbrella to shield you from the rain that falls on all of us, whether we like it or not, whether you like it or not, the rain will fall. Whether you like it or not, on some days, there's no rain. Don't blame the rain. Instead, we learn how to adapt. The Dhamma is the umbrella under which we stand to avoid being drenched. So it's actually quite simple. This is what I told the Rotarians, and this is what I will tell you to. It's actually quite simple. And the reason why religions became so complicated is because religions are led by human beings. And you will now understand, Sumin, why the Buddha was so adamant near his death when Ananda asked him, after you pass on, who will be our leader? And the Buddha said, the Dhamma, Vinaya will be your leader. He didn't want a man, a mortal to continue because human beings being imperfect create imperfect religions. Get it, Sumi? Human beings being imperfect will create imperfect religions, imperfect temples, imperfect centers, imperfect societies. We bring our faults, our envies, our jealousies into the system. We create rituals, we create rites. Why? Because we want them, not because the Buddha taught. So as His Holiness the Dalai Lama here says, it's actually very simple. In fact, there is no need for big complicated temples or complicated philosophy. If you want to study as Ajahn Chah always says, study your own mind. Your own heart is your temple. And the philosophy, the fundamental philosophy is kindness. Metta when you are with other people. That is the fundamental philosophy. And what do we learn it in more formal terms in Buddhism? In Buddhism, we call it, when metta is applied, dhamma, dana. So the dana can be of many things. It can be dhamma dana, whereby it is the offering of the dhamma, which is what this little group of people do every few Friday nights. We try to share the dhamma. But then you might say, I'm not that conversant. It really doesn't matter. You can go down to another level. 
the Dhamma of Dana, the Buddha said, is the highest form of Dana. Material Dana, fantastic work at Sakya Inn. I was really very impressed by the food pantry. I followed Brother, Lim, uh, Brother Han Kim Shi once when he went to deliver food to an elderly lady in one big old rambling bungalow house. Food was delivered right to the doorstep for her to eat. And I know of the food pantry whereby you give poor people a chance to eat a reasonably good meal free. That's dana of material things, whereby someone is offering money, food, that a young person who may not have money need or an old person who is sick requires. There's another form of dana, Sumin, which you are doing now. And that is the dana of your time. Are you aware, Sumin, that the dana of your time is even more precious than the dana of money? Money you can always earn again. But time, once gone, is irrecoverable. Now you are giving the dana of your time, the dana of your skill, your dana of making sure this meeting runs well. That is another form of dana. And in this primit, whereby we as lay Buddhists do our best to cultivate, that is the very foundation. Do not forget if a foundation is weak, the whole building will collapse. A building is only as good as its foundation. So our foundation is dana. Dana, sila, bhavana. So while you can dana time, skill, money, dhamma, you can also dana many things. Beyond that, like as I always share in these Friday nights, just a tapet to the security guard as you pass. We have security guards everywhere nowadays. When you enter any building, there's a security guard. Everybody takes a poor man for granted. In fact, find, many find him an irritant for checking your temperature, asking you to show the mice, etc. cetera. Something so simple as a thank you, a smile to acknowledge him. A dana of dignity to that man. I'm going to show you a very short clip of something so simple, but still within the very first foundation of our Dhamma Dana, our Dhamma practice, and that is the Dana of Metta, the Dana of kindness, the Dana of time. Something so simple as was shown in the examples there. Some years ago, I was listening to a talk on the history of religion. And the speaker, very wise, said, you know, people now look 
at the South Americans, and then we look at the Mexican culture, the Aztec culture, for example, and then we laugh and we say, oh, those poor fellows, you know, they actually worship the sun, you know, you see all these images of sun worship. Well, the worship of the sun is actually very common in the ancient days. If you look at pictures of saints, for example, or even of images of the Buddha, you will often see this round thing around the head. Not many people are aware that the round halo around the head is actually a remnant or a hand-me-down from the days of sun worship. And so what's wrong with sun worship? At least you can see the sun. People now worship things that they can't even see. So while well, that is a little bit distracting to the point I'm trying to make, when we talk of metta, when we talk of love, let us love something that you can see first. Let us have metta for the one who is mopping the floor, who is cleaning the toilet, that everybody ignores. So why are you saying I want to support someone in Kathmandu, hundreds of miles away, and you will not even bother to simply say good morning to the one who washes the toilet? This is what I'm trying to say. So we start very simply with Dharma. And I think all religions teach this. Generosity is one of the parameters, one of the perfections, and it can be at any level within our means. If you are rich, fine. You can dana material things. If you are not rich, you can always dana your skill, your time. And everyone is a leader at some level. Please remember that when the lowest level of society breaks down, entire structures in society will break down. Even the richest man cannot do anything if, let's say, the water supply is cut off or the people who provide electricity goes on strike and then you'll be in trouble. Despite all the wealth providing generators, ultimately we are dependent on this big pyramid. And there are lots of people at the lower end of the so-called pyramid that we take for granted. But then another question that was raised by the Rotarians is why are there so many issues within religion, between religions? And why is it even so many religions, including Buddhism, ISM, Buddhism, Buddhism, the religion. Why are there so many issues with bhikkhunis, big controversy a few years ago, etc. And I want you to listen very carefully to this really wonderful explanation given by a venerable. Please listen to this explanation. And I think it's really very enlightened. I've heard that in some Buddhist traditions, uh, women are treated differently. For instance, I've heard that in order to become a Buddha, a woman must first be reincarnated as a man. What do you feel about this? What is your opinion? Do you agree? Do you think this is antiquated? I'd like to, I'm curious. So there's a difference between Buddha's Dharma and Buddhism. Buddha Dharma is not a difference. So you have to define Dharma. Dharma means teaching. Dharma is a 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 teaching. So when I speak of Dharma, it speaks the teaching of the truth as spoken by Buddha. When I say Buddhism, I speak more of the cultural artifacts that surround the Buddhism. So when Buddha was alive, there was a great discrimination among, based on gender. 
as well as caste. 그런데 부처님은 인간을 카스트로 차별할 수 없다고 했습니다. But Buddha thought that you can't discriminate between humans based on their caste. 예, 출가해서 승려가 될때 누구나 아무런 제한 없이 받았습니다. So when a person wanted to become a monk, he received them without restrictions. 음, 그래서 이 상가 안에는 음, 이 수드라 하층 출신도 많았습니다. So there were a lot of uh, members from the lowest caste among his sangha, his original community of monks. 이 세상에는 네 개의 강이 있다. 네 개의 강. 네 개의 강이 있다. And he taught that there are four types of rivers in this world. 그러나 바다에 가면 하나가 된다. But they all become one sea when they flow out. 그처럼 어, 이 세상에는 네 개의 계급이 있다. So likewise, there are four different castes in this world. 그러나 내법 안에서는 하나다. But within my teachings, there is only one. 음, 또 어, 여성의 출가, 여성이 수행자 되는 것을 허용했습니다. And he he allowed for women to become a convert. 음, 물론 만, 많은 당시에 반대가 심했습니다. And there was a great opposition to that at that time. 당시에 여성은 사람이 아닙니다. Because at that time, uh, women were not considered fully human beings. 스스로 혼자서 사람이 될수 없었습니다. Because at that time, women were not considered capable of becoming wholly human beings by themselves. 어릴 때는 누구의 딸이어야 하고. Because they were had to be somebody's daughter when they were young. 결혼하면 누구의 아내고. And they were had to be somebody's wife when they were married. 남편이 죽으면 누구의 어머니입니다. And when the husband died, they had to remain as somebody's mother. So they were always labeled in attachment to some male. But for women to actually convert and enter into that community, then you are allowing them, in effect, to own themselves. 어, 이것은 음, 여자도 하나의 독립된 인간이라는 거예요. And acknowledging uh, that they are one independent, self-sufficient human being. 어, 그것을 부터 당시에 허용을 했습니다. And he allowed that while he was alive at that era. 그런데 300년, 400년이 지나면서. But after 300, 400 years. 없어져 버렸어요. That practice disappeared. 어, 그리고. 인도의 전통 사상이 불교 속으로 들어왔습니다. And and Buddhism was died uh, by the originals uh, India's traditional ideologies. 어, 전통 사상에서는 여자는 다섯 가지가 되지 못한다는 게 있습니다. So in the original ideology of India, there are five things that women can never become. 왕 중의 왕인 전륜성왕이 되지 못하고. It can never be a wise king. She can never be a wise king. 부다가 되지 못하고. Could never be a Buddha. 인드라 신이 되지 못하고. Could never be Indra. 마왕 그러니까 네. 자제천 천상 왕 중에 한 사람입니다. 마왕이 되지 못하고 As cannot become one of the kings of one of the heavens. 브라만이 되지 못한다. And cannot become a brahmin. 어, 그것이 불교로 들어왔습니다. And so that traditional Indian belief system enter into Buddhism. 그래가 여자가 부처가 되지 못하니까. And since from according to that tradition, women cannot become a Buddha. 여자는 승려가 될 필요가 없다. Then they said, therefore, women do not need to become a monk. 살아서 좋은 일 많이 해서. So just do good deeds in this lifetime. 다음 생에 남자가 돼서. And be reborn as a man. 그래서 부처가 되라. And then try to become a Buddha then. 부다의 가르침이 아닙니다. But that's not Buddha's teaching. 어 그러나 불교 역사 속에서는. 지금 이렇게 자리 잡고 있습니다. But in the historical uh, evolution of Buddhism as an institution, that actually has taken root. 음 그러나 이것은 현재 테라바타의 부디즘의 전통이긴 하지만은 보다 단만은 아닙니다. And it is part of the Theravada tradition of Buddhism, but it is not part of Buddha's original teaching. 음 그러나 현실적으로 차별이 있는 건 사실이에요. But it is true that we have to recognize that in today, in our current reality, there is discrimination in Buddhism against women. 불교라기보다는 본문 사회의 하나의 문화입니다. But instead of uh, labeling that as Buddhism, is actually a lingering artifact from a feudal society that we lived in. 음 불교가 그런 세속적인 것을 수용한 거죠. And it is Buddhism that actually have accepted, been corrupted by that. Tradition. 그래서 불교 문화라고는 할수 있지만은 부다담만은 아닙니다. So that discrimination, we can say it is part of a Buddhist cultural tradition, but you can't say it is part of Buddha's original Dharma teaching. 더 질문 있으세요? Do you have any follow-up question? That was, that was amazing. <laughs>
Well, Sister Sumin, I hope that explanation put it really very clear because I thought Venerable really gave a fantastic explanation. And I think that all of us, whether we are leaders or not leaders, whether we are just simple lay followers or we are people serious in pursuing more and more knowledge, we really have to understand in our minds that there is a difference between the Dhamma and the religion. The Dhamma as taught by the Buddha in many ways is not what is practiced in the religion because the religion has adapted many, many, many different cultures, local preferences, etc. into it. What Ajahn Brahm calls the icing on the cake. Let us always go back to the cake and not so much be distracted by the icing. The Dhamma is the cake. The rest of all the paraphernalia of rites, rituals, dressing, blah, 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 all that are the icing. And Sumin, this is the first time I'm meeting you, but I've shared this many, many a times, Sumin. We always say, Pa Wan Si Tian Fa Men. And this is not Mahayana. This is, in fact, in the Taragata. It is a venerable Ananda who said that there are 84,000 teachings, 82,000 of which is taught by the Buddha and 2,000 by his senior monks. And out of these 84,000 teachings, it will be really very complicated if every one of you try to remember 84,000 different teachings. But please remember, Sumin, these 84,000 teachings have a simple common core. Eight for the Eightfold Path. Four for the Four Noble Truths. And the three zeros, the three universal characteristics, of Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha. Permanence, non-self or not-self, and dissatisfaction. The first two discourses of the Buddha, the Dhammachaka Pavatthana and the Anatta Lakana, actually is the very core, the very spine of the Buddha Dharma. So let us not forget that we must not confuse ourselves between what is Dhamma and what is the organized religion. And as I mentioned earlier, organized religion is invented and led by human beings who are imperfect. So they will bring in their own preferences, their own culture into it. And hence, today when you look at it, at this point in time, it may be confusing and even contradicting to the things that you will hold here. And I think Venerable they had explained it so well that I can't put it any better. So it's really very simple. So you practice your dana, you practice as best as you can, you keep your sila, which we all chanted just now. Now the precepts are not commandments. The precepts are training rules, they are sikapadam. They are like traffic lights. So if Sumin is to jump across a traffic light or drive through and it's red, wouldn't that be foolish? It certainly will be. Now, those precepts are our traffic lights. They caution us that if you break them, you may get into serious trouble. So because of that, because we are unenlightened people, we need this to guide us. And so the five basic precepts for the lay person are the traffic lights to try and stop us from getting ourselves into trouble. Now, then of course we practice metta karuna, unconditional love, compassion. And let's take a look at what the, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, says about compassion, which is the next thing. So it's a two levels, two levels of compassion. One level is more uh, biological factor. That compassion, no need training, no need help of wisdom, spontaneous. 
like compassion from mother to their children, or compassion or sense of concern of your relatives. At least those relatives, you see, show you positive attitude. <laughs> Even those those relatives, they say the negative re attitude. Forget. <laughs> even, even you see, instead of the sense of concern of well-being, even you should wish more trouble for them, like that. So these are uh, biological factor and very much oriented about others' attitude. Now, second level of compassion is now beyond that, not oriented the others' uh, attitude. So disregard others' attitude but still they are human beings and furthermore they are sentient beings uh, why we love ourselves not the reason we kind to ourselves no but simply i want happiness i do not want suffering because of that they say i have the right to overcome suffering so that logical process the other rest of six million human beings all have same, all do not want suffering, want happiness. So they also deserve, you see they, because of that, uh, to achieve happiness. And they're passing through difficulties, we must respond, sense of concern for them. So that is <coughs> genuine compassion, second level compassion. That compassion, uh, not sort of biased, not oriented attitude, but oriented being itself okay. to the person or to the sentient being. So that unbiased, that kind of compassion, you know, through training, through reasoning, as I mentioned earlier, today's reality, my future depends on them. So I have to take their interest ultimately for my own interest, like that. So, I'm so happy when I see the youths, Sister Sumin showed us pictures of the youths doing good work in Malacca, providing food, supporting people. Now that's training the second level of compassion. I think that the first level, as His Holiness said, between mother and child, you and your boyfriend, you and your girlfriend, husband and wife, that is very easy and very spontaneous. But what is difficult is to develop compassion towards someone whom you do not know or someone who is perhaps not so pleasant. And that is the level of compassion that the Buddha challenges us to try and develop. And you can only truly, truly be that altruistic and really have the perfection of metta karuna when one truly understands non-self. Then it is only possible for one to have truly unconditional love, unconditional compassion. But at our level, as we train, again, as I said, it's really very simple. Let's not make it complicated. You have your dana of all the things I mentioned. We keep our training rules as best as we can. And we develop metta. We develop karuna. Now, I have repeatedly shared, Sumin, many, many a times that metta is not a noun. Sumin, metta is a word. You can say metta, 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 metta a zillion times and do nothing or you can do something. So metta, I've always taught my students, it's a word. Our actions speak so loud that no one can hear what we say. So of course, some cheeky people, including one of my very good friends, childhood friend, I think he should be listening in today. Some time ago was raised because they know I'm very good at scolding medical students. So they said, how do you reconcile, Prof Wong, between your training as a Buddhist and the fact that you need to scold them? And I say, oh, it's very simple. I scold them with great compassion and very mindful. 
So compassion, as we said, the second level, I'm glad Sikia Inn is doing very good work with the food pantry and the very, very good work that they already had even before that of supporting elderly people, single people, people who need help within Malacca. And for that, I really applaud them. So as I said, Dhamma is really our ultimate refuge. So as the little cartoon showed, it's really very simple. And I'm glad in the little video that was shown to us just now that your training at Sikia Inn has encompassed everything that I tried to share. In fact, after watching that video, I thought maybe I can just relax tonight. No need to share already because everything that I want to share has already been led by Kim Sri at Sikia Inn in his training of you all. Now, the next thing that we must develop, again, very simple, gratitude. Remember the Buddha's first teachings, Sumin? If I had to ask Sumin now one question, she asked me three, now I'll ask her one. I don't want to stress her, so she did not have to answer. You have to ask her, Sumin, my dear, what is the Buddha's first teaching after he became enlightened? And then Sumin will say, hmm, 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 first teaching. Uh, is it the middle path? Is it the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana? Or is it Eightfold Path? Or is it the Four Noble Truth? Well, then if she's a medical student, but she's not, then she will meet my scolding with great compassion. The first thing the Buddha taught after his enlightenment is not in words. But in action, he taught gratitude. Remember Sumin, what the Buddha did after he became enlightened? He showed his gratitude to the Bodhi tree that sheltered him in his quest for enlightenment. For one week, he expressed his gratitude. So the next thing, dear Sumin and all the youths listening in and all the not so youths listening in, beyond the dana, the sila, the compassion, the metta that I spoke about, is gratitude. That is very important.
Okay, I think that again says it very well. All right, let us always be grateful. Despite this terrible pandemic, we still are reasonably comfortable. We still have food on the table and we still have this internet for us to share. So the principles are very simple. It is how we are going to apply it. And let us take a look at this Chan teaching here. Bakoye 我們都知道... Do you get that? If you don't understand Cantonese, I will translate it. The man came to ask the Zen master, the Chan master, in one day's training, in one day's practice, how can I do to make it good, to make it perfect? And he answered, something you would have learned in Dhammapada verse 182. He said, in one day's practice, do your very best not to do anything unwholesome to do everything which is good and wholesome and to train your mind. That is what he told him. And this gentleman replied, well, master, what you said, even a three-year-old knows that. And the master replied, yes, indeed. Even a three-year-old knows. But even a hundred-year-old man is not doing it. So I get it. You get it. If we all get it, then let us put this verse 182 in the dham of the Dhammapada into our daily lives because that is all that is needed. And every day we try to do these three things. Because again, quoting from the Dhammapada, verse 19, through many sacred texts he chants, the heedless man's no practicer. As a cowherd counting the other's kind, the other's cows, eh? in Samana sheep, he has no share. So what is in this verse 19 of the Dhammapada is that yes, you may chant and chant and chant every kind of sutra and every kind of chant that you are aware of, but you do not actually put it into practice. Just like the Chan master here is saying, you are like a cow herd. You are counting the cows of your neighbor. And so you're not going to go anywhere. And this is one of my favorite. So few of the sacred texts he chant. In Dhamma does his practice run. Play of delusion, lust and hate. Wisdom perfected. The heart well, so it is not the rituals which are important. In fact, there are hardly any rituals. The only rituals is in the ordination of monks and nuns. The only rituals is for the reading of the Vinaya and the practice of the Vinaya on the Kosaka days. For the rest of us, there are hardly any rituals. So though few of the sacred texts he chant, but you practice. And so again, Sister Sumi may ask, but what, what is this practice? Well, dana, sila, bhavana. Dana, I've already said. Sila, I've explained. Metta, karuna, I have shared. And what is the third part? The training of the mind. Training of the mind. Try your very best to avoid doing anything unwholesome. Because it starts in the mind and to do things which are wholesome. Try and train the mind in metta, karuna, and try and see reality instead of what we want to or prefer to see. Play of delusion, play of lust, play of hate, wisdom perfected. So, this is where, uh, Brother Ananda Fong's. One of his favorite sayings too, and we often teach that regarding this line. So, dear Sumin, ultimately, Sumin, your monastery is not Sikya In. Sikya In is, of course, a wonderful institution, 
But dear Sumin, ultimately, the monastery is your life. This is your monastery. And I'll be the most happy person if your youth group at Sakya Inn is to undertake this project and make this a t-shirt. Do send me one extra large size. I think this will serve as a wonderful room. So I'm going to show you this one teaching here. I would like to ask this question. Um, is, there, is there anywhere you find uh, extraordinary teaching in Buddhism that you cannot find in any other religions? Thank you. Yes, that is a very good question. <laughs> There must be a reason for Buddha to introduce another religion, we have to use the word religion, in spite of various other religions that existed in India at that time. Main reason is Buddhism paved the way for people to think freely without depending on any external sources. But all the other existing religions depend on external sources. Second reason, Buddhism encouraged people to lead a normal life, not necessary to suffer in the name of religion and not necessary to torture their physical body because of their religion. On the other hand, give due respect to human intelligence because religions give faith develop faith by giving something for people to believe. Buddhism never does that. Buddhism never gives anything for people to believe. Buddhism encourages for people to open their mind, to see, think unbiasedly, and then instead of developing faith or belief, they gain confidence and understanding. Uh, these are the extraordinary characteristics that we can find in the teachings of the Buddha. Just because the Buddha has introduced this religious way of life for us to maintain our human dignity, giving due respect to human intelligence and maintaining humane qualities. Uh, that these are the things that I have to mention as a special characteristic. Would you like that? So, Sumin, I think again that makes it very, very clear. It's actually very simple. It is within you, not something external. And I always repeatedly actually appeal to people. I've said this many, many times never commit intellectual suicide, never. Always use your intellect, look around you, verify, experience it yourself, and do not commit intellectual suicide. Whatever the teachings, always look at it from your experiential viewpoint, your direct insight, and if it agrees with what you can verify yourself, it can agree with what is wholesome, what is praised by the wise, what is good for you, what is good for other people, then only you accept it. You will see this sounds familiar, Sumi, because this is what the Buddha challenges to do in the Kalama Sutta. This is what the Buddha praised Sariputta, and Sariputta said, he will not accept even the teaching of the Buddha until he has verified it himself. So you do not surrender to an external being. You do not put your intellect in the backseat. 
but you use your intellect and you use it very, very critically well. Because if what is taught in religion goes against what is, for example, reality as seen by science and by yourself, that means it is wrong. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has gone to the extent of saying that if ever science proved some aspect of the Buddha Dharma wrong, then we will have to change. So far, that incident had not occurred. So please, this is especially appealing to young people, do not commit intellectual suicide. So coming back to simplicity, let us not make things very complicated. You do not need very complicated philosophies, very complicated studies. You need just the foundational knowledge to give you the start to write views. With that education and your cultivation of dana, sila, bhavana, practice of metta and karuna, you will transform. And your transformation was as shown in the video just now. What is your priority? What are your goals? What are the things you hold on to? What are the things you're willing to let go? And that will tell us truly whether you have lessened your greed, you have lessened your anger, you have lessened your ego, and whether your priorities are now not just materialistic, but priorities which are wholesome. Now, nobody owes you a living, so of course you need to earn a living. That is very clear in the Mangala Sutta and the Sigalovada Sutta. You need a skill, you need a living. You need a living, you need an honorable profession because with that, you can support your spiritual pursuit. So, we strike a balance. That is why it's the middle part. And I would encourage everyone to remember this wonderful teaching by this venerable so clearly pointed out to make sure we all remember that there is a wide gap between what is Dhamma and what is the organized religion called Buddhism. Sakya In is in a particularly advantaged position because Sakya In is non-sectarian and that puts Sakya In at a tremendous advantage because here you are exposed and you have opened your minds to so many teachings. You will see in my sharing, I tried my best to include teachings from the various traditions because there is no patent right. There is no copyright on truth, Sumin. Truth is simply the truth. And truth does not need to be defended. You do not need to defend truth. The truth stands by itself. Thank you, Sumin, and I pass it back to you now. Hi, Dr. Punya. Thank you so much for the insightful talk on simplicity. Um, your talk on simplicity, uh, from what I could see and from what I could understand, has opened our eyes and mind into Dhamma and stimulate many minds to think about practicing simplicity. Right, um, so now we have a few questions coming from the audience. The first one that I would um, like to show you is um, a question from Leong Yu Ming. Uh, he posted this question on Sekia in um, Facebook page, um, comment section under the live video. So he asked, how simple should the simplicity be? especially from this hectic life and materialistic um, society to be simply good. Well, Brother Yu Ming, good to hear from you. I, I have been answering questions from Brother Yu Ming for the last, I don't know, a year or maybe even more. More than a year, in fact. Yeah, from our first sharing, Brother Yu Ming, from the first sharing uh, hosted by Sister Li Ming uh, and uh, Subang Jaya. Good to hear from you. I hope you're keeping well, Brother Yu Ming. So how simple should your life be? Your life should be as simple as you want it to be. Now, I have always said, there is nothing wrong, brothers and sisters, 
in being rich. Absolutely nothing wrong. It is how you earn your wealth and it is how you spend your wealth that is important. If you have earned your wealth without breaking the five basic fundamental precepts, that means don't jump the traffic lights, then that is righteous wealth. And with righteous wealth, you can use that wealth in many ways. You can help people. You can make your family comfortable. And these are all listed in many suttas as taught by the Buddha, which I'm sure you are familiar with. So how simple do you want your life to be simple? Well, I always tease a brother here who just not too long ago bought a BMW. So I mean, when you are 20 to 30 years old, you want a BMW desperately because a BMW means bring more women. So you imagine that when you drive a BMW, you attract all the pretty girls in Sikhya Inn as you drive that, wow, five series or seven series into the car park of Sikhya Inn. Then when you're 30 to 40 years old, you realize that BMW, what? Banyak problem. Banyak masuk workshop. Okay? All, all the time enter workshop. And then you also learn it. Banyak makan wang. Wah, every time enter workshop, 20K gone. 20K gone. So finally, at the end of that very expensive tuition lesson, you will learn that BMW will finally stand for bring much wisdom but you had paid very heavy tuition fees. So if you can well afford it on a company budget, why not? But if you are just a simple man like me, retired, then a simple proton serves just as well. And many people are very, very surprised, you know, when they see that I drive a proton and my wife drives an Alza. But as far as we are concerned, that is enough for our lifestyle. So how simple you want, brother Yu Ming, is entirely up to you. Whether you want to stay in a big bungalow, you stay in a big bungalow, you have big bungalow problems. You want to stay in a condo, you've got condo problems. You stay in an apartment, you have apartment problems. With every choice, there will be problems. So you decide what those problems are. And if you are to ask me, as you did, and I will say I will choose the one that gives me the maximum peace of mind. It will give me the least distractions from what I would need in my life, from what I will want in my life. And many people are surprised I retired from medical practice at the age of 60. I have patients who actually come and tell me, why doctor, you can easily work another 10 years and earn lots of money. I said, if I want to earn lots of money, I can work until I'm 90. But that is not the point. The point is, what do you want, Sumin, in your life? What are your priorities in your life? I can't answer that question. So similarly, there is no right whether you drive a MyV or you drive a BMW. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's simply your choice. What do you want? If you want a BMW, fine, but you will have BMW problems. You drive a MyV, that's also fine but you will have mighty problems. So what is it that you want? So how simple your life is, is entirely up to you. I have good Dhamma brothers and sisters here who gave up lucrative careers to pursue a spiritual life. They could have gone on for 20 years and earned lots of money, but they say, no, that is not what I want. I always say this, Sumin, since you are very young, the first 25 years of your life, you study very, very hard. I studied so hard to be where I am. The next 25 years of your life, you work very, very hard to pay for all your excesses of falling mortally in love, having children, raising them, sending to university. Sex comes with a very high price. I hope you know it. So for the next 25 years, you pay. And what are you going to do with the last 25 years? I am in my last 25 years. How much more? I honestly do not know. But many, many members of my family are already dead at the age where I am now. So at least the last 25 years, what do we want? I can't answer that question for Brother Dr. U. I can't answer that question for Brother Bobby because every one of us is different. 
and every one of us will choose a walk which is different from the others. We are guided by the GPS called the Dhamma, but you can take different routes and you know your GPS will still guide you, some longer, some shorter. All right, thank you, Sumi. Thank you, Dr. Punya. Yes, um, because it's nearly 10 p.m. right now, so I think we will wrap up this sharing session here today. So um, before we end this session, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, can everyone see it now? Okay, so um, here are some key messages that I got from Dr. Punya's talk today um, that I would like to share with all of you as a recap of the talk um, on simplicity. So um, as Dr. Punya mentioned many times, Buddhism and Dharma are two very different things. So Dharma is our ultimate refuge. So to make it more relevant to our everyday life, he said that um, Dharma should be the GPS of our life. Dharma is the umbrella under which we stand to shield us, to protect us. And applied dharma comes in many forms and often they are as simple as saying hi or thanks. Just like how um, Dr. Punya um, has showed us pre um, during his talk. So he thanked me for contributing um, dana. Um, the dana that I contributed today um, was in the form of my time and also my effort in um, organizing this um, talk. So I would also like to say thank you to um, Meta Buddhist Fellowship um, for inviting Sekia in to be the host of this session here today. And also um, shout out to Dr. Punya for sharing um, with us um, many different aspects of this topic, simplicity. Right. So, and also one of my favorite uh, quote that Dr. Punya included in his talk was from Dalai Lama which is the fundamental philosophy is kindness. 